Yes, Mr. Gamizu. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Sir, can I get the tape? Huh? Oh, I see. Just to display it, yeah. Hey. Okay. Uh, I don't know how to demonstrate this, and uh, who can we use, use to uh, to assist us with the demonstration of these measurements? Can we use the interpreter, my lord, Mr. Jonas, just to take the measurement from the floor to? 1.3 and to 1.6, that's all. Oh, you may not use a court official, use any other person. Ah, just for completeness. Yeah. Yeah. So, before I proceed, uh, did you take the measurement of the deceased body? On the deceased body? Yes. Uh, Meaning the height of the deceased. The height of the deceased. It's one point. We can't use the acoustic. What can we use? Mr. Mugamizu, what do you want to demonstrate? The height of the disease was 1.77. My lord, uh, actually I consulted with our ballistic expert. Yeah, what, what does he say? What? Now, my lord, may I just address the court? He says, according to him, I even indicated to my colleague... Are going to? I have even indicated to my colleague, Advocate Baloy, that he does not dispute the trajectory. <laughs> He, he, the, the measurements are consistent with his findings. So I was of the idea that we can just ask for the sake of completeness, but I can withdraw that question as well. No, no, you don't have to withdraw anything. I just want to understand what do you want to demonstrate? Yes, I want to check if that 1.34 was the exact um, measurement from the floor from the to, the, to the entrance wound. How do you demonstrate that? Because you've got to get a person with one What's the, 1 .7. the height of uh, the, the deceased? The height of the deceased was 1.77. Yeah, get a person with that height. I don't know where you're, going to, where you're going to get it. And then you can say he must demonstrate how he located the wound on the chest and the exit wound on the, at the back. Fine. Yeah, there's something that I wanted to demonstrate, actually. My Lord, I'll try to to see how can I secure somebody with the, the height of 1.7. Is it 1.77? 1.77. Yes. Mm. I'm not sure how, yeah? From speed how? Yeah, 1.2. Yeah, 1.2. <laughs> so, my Lord, may I? It will be difficult to get the person now. Actually, your laser, ask him, the laser is more accurate. Actually, it will actually foretell what you can't prove. Because he will put it on where it says 1.77 and beam the light. Now you want to do it with uh, Pro Brugger's uh, measurement. Now, we can use both, my lord. We can use the laser just to give a guideline.
May I request the, the witness to use the laser at the moment? Yeah, if you want him to use the laser, fine. Because it's difficult to get uh, the person with such a height. Uh, <coughs> but for my edification, what is this exercise in aid of? Because the evidence is clear, the deceased sensor was shot from the front. Um, yes. And the alleged, this is his evidence. The alleged shooter was a bit taller than Sonzo. And the trajectory of the fire or the bullet went downwards. Is that not what you said, sir? Marot, the entrance wound is a contact shot in the chest. That's it's it, yeah. higher than the exit wound at the back. That's the point. So the trajectory yes. is... It's a but my concern is that the disease was not standing upright. It was slightly bending forward. Do you agree with me? According to your observation, my lord, it's difficult to can yeah. say that he was bending a little bit front or to, to the front or was standing up straight. Because if you look at the trajectory, if he's standing up straight, the entrance is uh, just a little bit higher than that. The minute he bends down, it changes the trajectory completely. Mm -hmm. Because when the body bends to, to the front, your trajectory can be a little bit straight. Yeah. And if it's a little bit straight. It doesn't fit to the trajectory of the bullet damage on the door mm -hmm. because the damage on the door it will not be in the same level as your entrance and exit wound. So what I would say is most likely was standing up straight where it enters at the front at the, the one point, I think it's 1.36 and mm. 1.26 at the back, 1.34 1. at the front, 1.26 1. 1. at the back. And then the door is 1.2. So yeah. it's a downward trajectory. And between the deceased and the door, there's a space, there's an opening. So yes. on that opening, it allows the bullet to, 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 to travel a little bit down with about six centimeters, if you compare. Because if it was against the, if this bag was against the, 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 the door, the trajectory that doesn't fit. So he has to move a little bit to the front to create the space where the, the bullet can give the grace of losing about six centimeters to hit the door. Mm. Mr. Jonas, must I proceed? All right. So uh, when I was listening to your evidence in chief, you cannot rule a possibility that there was a struggle over there between the deceased and the, the shooter. Can you rule the possibility that there was a struggle. My lord, since the disease was shot in a contact shot, it's a loose contact shot. So in a loose contact shot, you cannot rule out the possibility that the disease could have been the deceased hands could have been on the firearm or there could have been a struggle between the deceased and the, 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 the shooter. Yeah, the probabilities could be two in relation to what I'm going to tell you. If there was a struggle, uh, if there was a struggle between the deceased and the shooter, especially on the damage, the damage on the floor, and you said it was approximately 90 degrees. That's correct, my lord. Yes. So the probability could be if there was a struggle, the firearm could have been facing down as a result a 90 degree shot was fired. Can we rule? In that instance, where the shot was the, the, uh, the 90 degrees to the ground, yes. the firearm will be facing downwards. There's Correct. no other direction that it will face. It will be facing downwards. So to say that downward, or the distance between the ground and the firearm cannot be determined, but it was definitely facing downwards.
ukuti ke kushaye ke uthayela lapha yathi lokho kusho akuthi ayikho indlela isibhamu ngabe sasibheke ngakho na sasibheke ezansi kodwa ke ukuthola ke ibanga phakathi bala kwesibhamu nala isibhamu ihlamba yashaya khona phansi lokho ke amgeke ke ukuthola kanye the possibility the second possibility that the probability that i want to put in a form of your evidence could be that if a struggle for the if there was a struggle between the deceased and the and the shooter was on the level of a shoulder a 90 degrees also could be a possibility to strike on the ground on a level of a shoulder if they were standing upright maybe they were fighting for the or whatever way they were fighting for but on a level of a shoulder and a firearm is facing downwards could that possibility exist that at that 90 degrees was shot on that level? My Lord, I cannot comment on the position of the firearm, whether it was at shoulder level. If it's at shoulder level, to turn it at 90 yeah, degrees, it's, it's, it's difficult. But if the hand is down, on this, facing down, this is the most likely it could have been the position. But at this end, and then you shoot down at 90 degrees, it's difficult. It's almost impossible to do that. Uh, okay. Now let's proceed to where we ended before lunchtime. Then you proceeded to accuse number three, where he was, I think he was Johannesburg Correctional Accused Services. number three was Johannesburg Correctional Services. Yes. You, you did the same exercise with Brigad Yakinin. That's correct. Now. Was he present? Was Brigad Kininda present? Brigadier Kininda was present. Marat, I just want to rectify. I think I've uh, confused the two incidents. At Villaria, we met first in the office and then we went to at, 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 uh, no, at, yeah, at Pretoria North. Brigadier Kininda called me and I met Mohano Mo and someone else. I can't remember who was there, but I can recall that Brigadier was not there. <laughs> at, at, being a council, I'm sorry, Mr. Kennel Mangena. I'll just say it without even shame. I'm a counsel, I'll just tell you that in Sisu, I'll take what you said first. It's fine, but it's, a, it's what I can recall now, that what I'm saying, that I can recall that he was not there. Because you had a chance. You had a chance for the whole hour to recall your evidence. You never said that in your evidence in chief. You never said that in, on the records. You never said that you're just fabricating it now. No, in After, all, during lunchtime now, you think, ah, oh, no, 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 that's not true. Yes, but my Lord, please, my Lord, we've been through this. Uh, we've referred to the relevant portions of the record, namely page 53 of the record on the 30th of August, 2023. Because my Leonard should just revisit the record. My Lord, the witness confirmed that he was with Brigadier Kininda uh, at Pretoria North in one of the offices at the station. I'll just leave it for, the, for argument. That is on record. Whether he's fabricating or not, I'll, I'll, I'll make it as a submission during my argument. Let's just pass. That's not what the witness said, my Lord. He said at Valeria, not at Pretoria North. <laughs> Mr. Baloy. We'll just rewind it if you so, if the court so pleases. Let's move to accused number three. 
you, you also did the same <coughs> exercise. That's correct, my lord. But there's something that you, you suggested, which did not come from Kininda. After you concluded all these exercises you were performing on the heights of the accused, there's something that you suggested to look for any injury on the leg. Am I correct? That is correct, my lord. You are not the investigating officer in this case, correct? I'm not the investigating officer, but if it's ballistic related, and I've asked that, I will do that. Yeah, it's fine. You can do it at any time. But it is one thing that is strange. That suggestion came when you approach accused number three. You, need, you did not perform that when you were doing it to accuse number one and two, correct? That's correct. I did not perform that. And when I was at home looking at this thing, at the work also, I looked at this thing and I looked at the possibility. Then I said, but let me also do this and see if I can find anything from there. All right. So this thing came after you've done that exercise from accused number one and number two. <coughs> correct, my lord. I did that with accused number three and also with accused number four. So, I, were you aware of the, did you have the knowledge of the facts of this case? You didn't discuss the, 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 the facts of this case with Prakatiya The facts of the case on the crime six, scene three, itself. Six. On the crime scene itself. The facts of this case. Person who shot sense or when sense was shot, who was in the house, all things that are relevant relating to 636. We did not discuss with him. Driving from wherever, Silverton to Valeria, from Silverton to Protean, uh, wherever, to Kalagabusha, to Lokop, you did not discuss this with Brigadier Kenin, the facts of the case. My Lord, the facts of the case mean, I don't know which facts of the case are we referring to. Are we referring to what transpired inside the house, or how did I reconstruct the incident in the so house? So you have decided, all right, let me just put it this way. When you heard about the death of Senzo Mayu, it has been reported on the media that how Senzo was shot. So I'm saying to you, when you met Brigadier Kininda. Did you have knowledge of the facts that transpired, either through the media or from any other person other than Brigadier Kininda? My Lord, the facts that I had was that I did the reconstruction and based on my findings on the reconstruction, those are all the facts that I have where I was sure of the, my incident the case. And Captain Bentley, Bentley, he did not uh, brief you with the facts as to how this thing happened for you to process the, the crime scene. He did not brief you about the facts. I need clarity on which facts, because I don't know... As to how Senzo was shot. How Senzo was shot, that's how I could determine. That's how, how I Senzo was shot. I just want to know. If you were not briefed, it's fine. We'll move on. If you were not briefed, it, I can just leave it for argument, because you are a South African citizen, you reside around, you work around Pretoria. So let's just leave it for argument. Let's move on. You went to... My concern is that when you approach accused number three, the suggestion came from you. 
with an attempt to assist Brigadier Kininda to find an alternative way of getting the suspect. That's when you suggested that you should look at a person who was injured, who was injured. When it's your evidence that when he took out his shoe, then he told you that he was injured when he was playing football. Is that is that correct, so? Malo. That's what he told me. I'll leave that for Mr. Mnisi to advance on it, but did he consent, did he voluntarily say that to you? That's correct. He voluntarily said that. The only thing, the only thing that I have requested from you is that can you take off your shoes and your socks? I just want to check something on your legs. Yes. And that's when he said no. The scars that you can see on my legs are from my childhood when I was playing soccer out there. Okay. So what was your response after he, he did that? What did you do after that? Or what did you say after he has taken out those? Well, look, I didn't say anything. I continued to check, but I couldn't see any scars on the legs. But I'm, I'm going back to the, to the same question, to the same evidence that you said, if a person was closer to the person who shot on the ground, could be injured. There was a possibility that even the person who was holding a firearm could have been injured by those, frag you said, fragmented and cause uh, damage to the next person. Was it possible that even the shooter could be uh, uh, injured? That's correct, Manu. Pos that possibility cannot be ruled out. And after you, you have checked accused number three and you concluded that there were no injuries. My Lord, not necessarily that there were no injuries. Yes. I could not see any scars because the fragments would be very small. They could have created very small scars. And if you look at the time when we did the conducted the test and the time of the incident, it's how many years passed. So the possibility that there could have been injuries and the, 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 the wounds were healed and the scars were because they were very small, I couldn't see them. Based on what you are just saying now, the suggestion that you made to Brigadier Kininda, that means it was fruitless. It was fruitless because it didn't produce any results. Not necessarily fruitless. If I could have seen something. But you I didn't find anything. But because I didn't find anything. That's correct. It's, it's the same as taking all the measurements. I took all the measurements to try and determine something, but I couldn't determine anything Thank you. from that. So it's not fruitless. If anything could have transpired there, I could have I would have said something about it. I would have said this is what I could determine, this is the possibility or the likelihood. Let's move to accuse number five. You went to where he was kept and you said he refused to be to be checked. That's what you said. That's correct, my lord. <coughs> number four. You went to local prison. Then you proceeded with the same exercise to accuse number four. That is correct, Malot. number four No scars, nothing, no traces of any injuries. I couldn't see anything also. All right. I just want to understand 
but I'll get, I'll, I'll get to it as I'm getting with your evidence. Because I, you said it's part of your job description to go with the investigating officer to perform such uh, exercises that you've done. It's, it's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. With a ballistic expert going with the investigating officer to make such a follow-up information on the heights of the accused. And My Lord, for us to go out to a crime scene, do reconstruction, we receive requests from the investigating officer. And I cannot do that examination without the presence of the investigating officer. He must be there when I conduct that. If he asks me, call me and ask me to assist with something, I would go and check. If it's possible for me to assist them, I will assist. And if it's not possible, I will also tell him that it's not possible to get that. All right, no, it's fine. Let's now get into the date Brigadier Kininda called you. Or if he called you or you talk with him regarding the suspect who was sentenced for a firearm. Can you relate on that? The suspect was... Sorry, let me just rephrase it. Uh, what actually led you to go to... What is that? Cleveland. What led you to go to Cleveland? To Police Cleveland? Station? Yes. My Lord, after we went to, to accused number 3 at Johannesburg Prison, Brigadier Guinida told me, informed me that he had information that Accused number three is the main suspect in this case, and he wants me to check if the firearm that he was arrested with in Cleveland, can we check the firearm and compare it with the bullets? Okay. <laughs> Did you go to Cleveland alone or you were in company of Brigadier Kininda? When I went to Cleveland, I went alone. So you had the, the description of the firearm that you were looking for? My Lord, what transpired here is after telling me the, that he was uh, the, the case, the, giving me the case number of Cleveland, I went to our system and checked with the Cleveland. I could see the lab number on the case number. And I got the case file of that Cleveland case. And, and after getting the case file of Cleveland, I compared the bullets which were fired in that firearm on the Cleveland case by a warrant officer rule of sale. Okay. And when I compare the bullet from the crime scene, the first Loras crime scene, with the test on the Cleveland case, I could see some similarities, but because of the type of bullets which were, uh, were in the Cleveland case. The bullets in the Cleveland case were the full metal jacket. And the bullet on the first Loras case 
was the CMJ, the complete metal jacket. And the two are the same caliber, but two different materials of the bullet. Then I, I start to compare them, but I could see some class characteristics and some similarities that I, that's when I decided that I need a firearm so that I can shoot the correct test in this firearm. So what you are telling the, the court just now, is it in your affidavit? It's in my affidavit. Yes, is it in your 212 statement? My Lord, I don't put everything in my two and two statement. Is it I'll in put your diary? What is what, what I'm saying now? Mm. I did the test. I, I've mentioned in my report before I could go and get the firearm. I have mentioned that. Did that you know I have the compared the tests in the Cleveland case with this. I could see some similarities, but I needed to shoot additional tests with the correct ammunition. All right. Before you, you left your office to Cleveland, was it the correct procedure for you to follow if that firearm was not brought into you by the case administration? Well, that's the correct procedure also. When firearms are collected from the crime scene, or maybe from the suspect or something, they are sealed by the investigating officer, they are sent over by LCRC, they are sent to the lab to be registered. But in this instance, it's a different instance. This firearm was not with the owner or was not collected from the crime scene. It was at the lab. And after the case was finalized on the Cleveland case, it was sent back to the station. Now, if I want to shoot the test, additional test in this firearm, what I could do is I've checked the type of firearm, check what type of firearm is it, where the firearm is, and I went to the station to check if the firearm is still there. The procedure that we have on collecting the firearm, sealing the firearm, is when it's sent by the IO or by LCRC. Mm. In this instance, booking out the firearm at the SAP 13, what procedure do we follow? It's the normal <coughs> procedure that every police officer can follow. Lanage <laughs> All right. If this firearm was with the owner or was with the company, I wouldn't go and collect it from the owner or the company. I would request the, the investigating officer to go collect it and then send it to us. Mm. But because it's at the station, the procedure there at the police station is a police officer can go book it out at the SAP to conduct the test. That's what the procedure that I did. Did you have any indemnity form or any form authorizing you to possess that firearm? Any Did form you? to possess the firearm meaning what? <coughs> Let me just put it straight so it will understand. When you left your office driving to Cleveland to fetch the firearm, what document that authorized you 
to go and fetch that firearm. Well, I had the case number and I was busy working on that case. LCRC members don't have the indemnity when they collect exhibits from the crime scene to send them to the lab. The detective who collects the firearm from the owner or from wherever doesn't have that indemnity form that he's going to collect the firearm and bring it to the lab. That's the procedure that I followed. But you are not an investigating officer. But I'm a police officer. Say, let me just put it straight. You are driving from Cleveland in possession of the firearm. You are stopped at the roadblock. How would you explain that? I'm a police officer and I'm working on that case. <laughs> Are you aware of the indemnity form? I don't know of any indemnity form. Are you calling for me as the Okulumangayo Ebizamogutige indemnity form? Any letter written by the station commander or the commander uh, giving you authority to possess that firearm? Are you not aware of that authority? To possess which firearm? Exhibit yes. firearm? That exhibit is. Because you are not an investigating officer. But I'm a police officer and I'm working on that case. Not only, sorry, sorry, that's it, that's it. not only the investigating officer can carry the firearm that is in this case. We have cases where the investigating officer will send anybody, or any police officer from his office to bring the exhibits to the lab where we examine those firearms. Do they have the indemnity that they are in possession of a firearm that belongs to a case that they are not working on? So according, right. according to you, there's nothing that prevented you from telling Brigadier Kininda to bring that firearm at, at uh, for, for testing at uh, case administrators and there's nothing that actually influenced you to go and take that firearm without the knowledge of sorry let me just put it this way there's nothing that prevented you from informing Brigadier Kininda that you on that particular day you are going to fetch that firearm there's nothing prevented you my lord I informed him before I go there he knew that I was going to fetch the firearm there so now let's get into your, we'll leave that for argument because I can put it to you now that you were not authorized to, to possess the firearm. If you were stopped at the roadblock, you were going to be arrested for being in possession of a unlicensed firearm. My Lord, I don't believe in that. <laughs> that's, that's true what you're saying because you police now these days are doing as you please. You just carry firearms anyhow. Like now. That's a good place, my lord. I think that's an unfair sweeping statement to make. <laughs> Let me just justify what I was saying to you. For the first day, when the court asked uh, our ballistic expert, you were standing with Brigadier Kininda next to each other. That's correct, my lord. And Dave, and Dave was seated next, was standing next to you. That's correct, my lord. The, oh, the court asked, where is that firearm? Do you remember what Kininda said, Brigadier Kininda said? Can you recall? I can't recall that. <laughs> it, he said it, it, that firearm is not there. He didn't bring the firearm. And then you, you grabbed him and said, no, there is a firearm. My Lord, you, I think if I can recall, I, I can't recall exactly the words of Brigadier, but 
it was because it were the firearm is. I said, no, I have the firearm with me. No, no, no. Before you answered, say, Brigadier Kininda is the one who gave an answer first. Yes, but yes. I told him that I have the then firearm you, with you me. Then you pay his attention and say, no, you've got the firearm. The, the investigating officer is not aware that in possession of a firearm. The court is asking the investigating officer. So, by law, are you telling me or are you telling this court that you have the authority to keep the exhibits of the court? My Lord, there is a statement that Brigadier Gininda submitted that for safety reasons, I must keep the firearm with me because I've got a safe at the office. You can't leave it at the station. Anything can happen. So that firearm was not found from the safe where you collected it from Cleveland. At was Cleveland. it not in a safe? At Cleveland? Yes. It was in a safe? Yes. Yeah, but Cleveland is, uh, is, is from there, so it's actually safe. What prevented you from taking it back to Cleveland? Well, we, I took it back to Cleveland and a great bigger brigade didn't booked it out at Cleveland. He said, he's afraid, he feel that it's not safe there, then I must keep it. He even submitted a statement that I wrote that I must keep the firearm. Ever since he booked it out at Cleveland, the firearm was with me. It was in my exhibit safe. And on that day that we were here with Dave, I brought the firearm. He was not aware that I brought the firearm to court. Now let's, all right, thanks. let's get now to the full metal jacket and the complete metal jacket. When Rudolf say, was conducting the, you said it was, he conducted the test on a full, full market, on a full, full metal, metal jacket, yes. So what does that mean? If you, you conducted the test on a CMJ, if you, you conducted the test on a FMJ, you conducted the test on the CMJ. What did that mean, or what does that mean? My Lord, when we do examination at the lab, when you examine the bullet, maybe you compare the bullets from the crime scene with the firearm, or you compare the cartridge cases with the firearm, what we do is we will receive the firearm, we examine the firearm. When we shoot the test to be compared with the exhibits from the crime scene, we look at the type of exhibits that we have received. Mm -hmm. If your cartridge cases, let's say for argument's sake, is PMP, I'll shoot the PMP cartridge cases for comparison. If our cartridge cases from the scene are something like cellular and bellot, we'll also shoot the same type of uh, cartridge because the material of these cartridges <coughs> are not the same and some of them are hard to, when we shoot a test, you might struggle to find the same, ex exactly the same type of uh, marks on it. So when using the same type of exhibit, we're expecting to find more or less or very close or similar, exactly similar type of marks on it. Cellular and bellot. Cellular and bellot. Right. In case of bullets, we do the same thing. If I receive the, the, the hollow point, I'll try and shoot the hollow point. If I have, don't have the same type of hole, I'll shoot something that will be very close to that. 
in instances where I received the CMJ bullets, I will also shoot the CMJ bullets. Now, in the case of sorry, uh, for my client to understand it as well, the exhibit that were brought to you, were they the CMJs or the FMJs? Well, not the exhibit bullet from the crime scene were the CMJ, Correct. not the FMJ. Do you know why uh, Colonel Rudolph uh, used the FMJ in, in the examination? Warrant Officer Rudolph said when he was examining that he was doing his case, the Cleveland case. And in the Cleveland case, I don't know if there's any CMJs, because the test that he shot, I'm not sure if it's a PMP. I think it was PMP with the FMJ, not the CMJs. But you were examining the exhibits which are likely to be those that were examined by Rudolph. Rudolph, Rudolph did the comparison of exhibit cartridge cases from the other crime, the, the, the Cleveland uh, Alexander case. Yes. And what he did, what happened in this Cleveland case, it was a possession of unlicensed firearm. Where, when if, in cases of where we receive firearms like possession of unlicensed firearm, normally we shoot the PMP ammunition, and you can uh, acquire that on the IB system. But if you look at the case that I was uh, doing, the the, the first Loras case, it's the one bullet of CMJ. So it's two tests of FMJ on. Cleveland case, and in this case, it's one bullet of CMJ. May I approach your case number three? Yes, yes. Yeah, boy, yeah, boy, yeah, boy. We don't want to go there, too. I see no reason. Yeah? Okay. All right. And Mr. Ramsey PD, you also see no reason why you should go. Excuse me. Consult. Mm. I have fully consulted my Oh, I see. Good. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, my lord, for your indulgence. Yeah. <coughs> uh, Thank you, my lord, for indulgence. Mm -hmm. We were still on the examination by Rudolph. Okay. Um,
you conducted the, the examination on this with the CMJ using the CMJs and the exhibit with the CMJs. So, okay, what was your finding in terms of your microscopic analysis? Did you find anything matching between the exhibits and which test? My test or yes, your test. Rule of test. Yes. My test or warrant officer rule of test. Your test, you say. With my test, my lord, I went to fetch the firearm and came back with the firearm. I shot additional tests in that same firearm and I start to compare them with the exhibit bullet. How many bullets were in that in those exhibits? Exhibit. Uh, the live rounds. Meaning the cartridges, the, the yes, live rounds. Yes. In which in a box? In a box that they you found from uh, uh, Cleveland. I can't recall how many were they. How many did you test? How many shots? How many bullets did you use to fire? I used shots? two from the the box, and uh, the others I took from my office. Sorry, is it the blue box or the box? In the blue box, man. Yeah, at least there must. Okay. Now. Let me get into this evidence. Oh, this is the version I'm going to put to you, and this is what is also contained in statements that were made under oath. <coughs> There's a statement that was made by Longwe Twala, who was in the crime scene before Senzo was shot. According to his statement, he says the intruder was in possession of a 38 special revolver. And the test that we were doing were on the 9mm. And there's a difference between the two firearms, correct? That's correct, my lord. Uh, so before I get into the size of the of the bullet the 38 does not have a cartridge does not have a cartridge case my lord it does have a cartridge case no no maybe i'm putting it what is it that it drops down if you fire the shot what is it it's a cartridge case so even the 38 special, it does have the cartridge case. That's correct, Malot. It does have the cartridge case. But it doesn't. But it doesn't release it to the ground. Malot, the difference is with a revolver. Mm. Your cartridges or your live rounds fit into the cylinder. Yeah. The revolving cylinder, and you close the cylinder. When you pull the trigger, the cylinder rotates. Yes. Put the one on in, in uh, aligned with the barrel. You fire a shot. When you pull it again, it rotates against the other one. So mm. it does not eject cartridge cases on the crime scene. Yes. You have a pistol. With a pistol, every shot you fire, it ejects cartridge mm. cases on your scene. Yes. All right. So in this case, let me just put firstly the people who told, oh sorry, who made statements to the investigating officers that the intruders were in possession of a 38 special. I said long, we said that. Number two, Kelly Kumal, in, in her statement, uh, 
in front of Colonel Stenkamp, if I'm not mistaken. She made a statement to the effect that the intruders were in pos the intruder, that intruder, was in possession of an old 38 special revolver. If she can be called, maybe she can clarify that aspect. But she said... The uh, sorry, I thought you were calling her. I'll call her, my Lord. Yeah, no, no, that's what you said. No, no definitely I'll call her. Okay, fine. Yes. No, it's because now I thought you... If, if, if she was called... She said it's a 38 special, an old 38 special. The third person... The third person was uh, that guy from Devon, Tumelo Mashala. He actually gave a description of a firearm to the officer who attended the crime scene. I think it's Constable Mteto, if I'm not mistaken. And he described the firearm that it had that, uh, what do you call it, the thing that rotates, that Cylinder. wheel. You call it what? A cylinder. A cylinder. Flying wheel, they call it. A flying wheel. That's, that's township lingo. Yes. Yeah. He said he's got a, that flying wheel. And the officer who was taking the statement said, no, that is the type of a firearm, it's a 38 special. The fourth person who made a statement is the investigating officer, Brigadier Kininda, on A227, when he brought an application for the warrants of arrest, where he mentioned the 38 special. Four people mentioned 38 special. And according to your evidence, am I right? Uh, uh, sir, can I stop them, Mr. Jonas? But you are stopping late. So, my lord, just before lunch, I made a request to both the counsel and the witness. The question now, there's four people already mentioned. The question is long. The answer is also going to be long. I miss one word. They jump and say you interpret incorrectly. We so I ask the question to be very short, but it seems as if my request fell on deaf ears. Apology, Mr. Jonas. <coughs> no, you've been doing it the whole lunch. Apology. Time. May I just, you want me to start a phrase? One question at a time. All right. Uh, Tumelo Majala described to the firearm to the officer, Mr. Mteto and said it's a firearm that has a, a, a cylinder. What is it? Yeah, a flywheel. Mr. We <laughs> want to describe or interrupt my learned friend's cross-examination, but the witnesses have testified there's a court record wherein they qualified their answers. Um, now, you know, a very broad and, and, and um, uh, generous statement is being put to the witness when the witness who testified have qualified their statements, explained what they meant. Um, it would help if my learned friend was to perhaps refer to the relevant record, quote exactly what the witnesses said, instead of we, we uh, admire his memory, but... Uh, it's important that you should quote the relevant portions of the record and, and state exactly what the witnesses said um, in order for this witness to, to answer to such questions. Yes, Mr. Mgumezolo. I was relying on, I, I can quote the, the relevant portion You're of the record. On? I was relying on the statements made by these witnesses I'm talking about. Yeah, but the, now this gentleman, Mr. Baloui says, they actually testified in this court and qualified their answers, meaning the statement, fine, but they qualified their answers here. I take it under cross-examination and re-examination. The qualification was only made, I think, by Tumelo Madlala, not by the rest of the witnesses I'm talking about, because it's the only one that was confronted with the, with the state. I'm putting all the statements that were made by... No, no, I'm not... I'm just saying what he says. Yes. This is the only one person that was well, who qualified his evidence. Being an expert on forensic ballistic, you gave the distinction between a pistol and a revolver. 
I've put, oh sorry, we're still interpreting this day before we, int, uh, before Mr. Valoy interjected. All right, I said, Tumelo Majala, he gave the description in his statement that this firearm that was, was in possession of the intruder had a flywheel. And the officer said it's a 38 special. Mr. Jonas. Marot, I think my answer is going to be a bit long because I want to explain something. Yeah. <coughs> Marot, when you look at our crime scene yeah. or our incident, where does the incident start and where does the incident stop? How long does it take? Right. When we do incident reconstruction or crime scene reconstruction a lot. You divide it into a sequence of events. Right. Your incidents may start when the perpetrators or the suspects enter the house. So they entered the house, the witnesses saw a revolver. According to their statements. Sorry? Mm. After seeing the revolver, there was a struggle between the perpetrators or the, and the witnesses. For the mere fact that they saw a revolver when they enter does not automatically say this is the firearm that was used. But I can say to the court I've got a BMW keys in my pocket. That does not necessarily mean when I leave this court, I'll be driving a BMW. I might be driving another vehicle. <laughs> so when we do crime scene reconstruction, we look at the physical evidence that is at the crime scene. The bullet recovered in that crime scene or on that crime scene, it's a 9mm bullet. Mm -hmm. It's not a 38 special bullet. So if they saw a revolver when they entered, it does not necessarily mean that was the only firearm that the suspect came with. So the possibility of another firearm that was used cannot be ruled out since the bullet found it's a 9mm bullet, not a 3 special. Say, with due respect, this is not a court of speculations. Marot, I'm not speculating. This I'll be speculating if sorry, I say sir. the bullet that the revolver sorry, was sir. used, May but we find a 9mm bullet at the crime scene. Say, with due respect, Kenneth, the evidence before this court that the first person who entered the house was in possession of a 38 special, the second person who entered the house was in possession of a sharp object, if I'm not mistaken, not a firearm.
the witness is already answered. Uh, my learned friend asked exactly the witness to comment on, on the evidence he's commented. He said the fact that um, the, the witnesses might have seen a .38 special doesn't mean that that was the only firearm that, that they could have been armed with. <coughs> that kind of evidence must, that kind of question must be allowed because if a witness, if there are witnesses that came to testify in this court, their evidence cannot be changed by a speculation or by any kind of a possibility that might have occurred. You're talking out of your experience. You're not talking about what happened on that day. No, no, no. Hello, I... no, no wait, wait, wait. Yes, I'm listening. <clears throat> and the, this evidence is he did not find a point three eight, as you call it, bullet yes. in the house of Miss Kelly Kumar. Correct. He found a nine millimeter bullet or projectile in the house. So there was no 38, according to you. There was no, evidence, or bullet there was no or evidence of a .38 special at the crime scene. That's it. The .38 special. I'll talk, I'll, I'll give so many possibilities mm -hmm. as you invite more possibilities in this court. Because I even told you that there were senior officers that attended the crime scene. I'll tell you that. I'll give a possibility that when there was contamination of the scene, there was a reason to frame wrong people. My Lord, as I said, my findings or my statements in the reconstruction of the crime scene are based on physical evidence that I got from the crime scene. Whether there were people on the scene, those people will not change my findings. My findings will still yes. remain the same. Whether there was movement or there was contamination of the crime scene, but my findings will remain the same. I agree with you. If you are giving the wrong exhibits, you'll do examination and give results according to what you are giving. But the, qu the concern that I'm raising is that witnesses, including the investigating officer, brought an application under Section 43 and mentioned a 38 special that was used. Malot, if, if we're saying I was given the wrong exhibits, if we look at the bullet fragment or the, that was found in the crime scene, it's exactly consistent with the damage that is on the floor. And the shot was fired when those people were still inside, when there was this the struggle or argument inside the, the kitchen. So it's consistent with it. Who will ever bring an exhibit that will fit exactly on your crime scene? It's not possible to do that. The second bullet, because it went through the deceased, it went through the deceased body, it lost a lot of speed, it lost a lot of energy. When it exited the bed, it was tumbling. If you look at the damage on the door, it shows that the bullet was unstable. It hits on the side and because of the less speed that it had, it ended up where it was found. It was still intact, it was still in shape. There was only a minor dent on that bullet, which shows that on impact on the door, on the wall somewhere, it has already lost a lot of energy on speed. So it was consistent with the trajectory also on this one. So both exhibits are consistent with the crime scene, how I found the crime scene. Manje, Sego, Natigay, is being in Namagay speed. It's a singer, 
kuyona le yonhlamo manje ke ubanike ongaletha ke ufakazike uma uthi ngikezwe ufakazi obudongo okuzohambulana nomfana ngamashi nalokho ekwatholakala khona lapha ya All right tell me were there any cartridge cartridge cases that we found at the crime scene my lord there were no cartridge cases found in the crime scene if a firearm, if a pistol was used, there was a possibility of uh, the, the cartridge cases uh, discharged from the firearm. That's correct, my lord. There was that possibility, but not there must be cartridge cases found. The possibility is there. And if you look at, as I said, if you look at the, the, the shot that when, when the, the deceased was fired, was shot, or was the, the shot that killed the deceased, as I said, it's the possibility of a struggle over the firearm cannot be ruled out. In that instance, what could have transpired? If somebody is putting a gun, you're trying to pull, and you hold a gun on the, for the slide, a shot is fired. You disturbing the cycling of the firearm. The possibility that this firearm is not going to eject the firearm cannot be ruled out. So there's a possibility that the shot was fired, but the cartridge case was not ejected. Yes. 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 What's your time there, Mr. It's 21 minutes past three. 21 minutes past three. Okay. You are, you're available tomorrow, I take it. That's correct, my lord. Sir, my lord, are we adjourning? No, no, if you want to continue, continue up to half past. I don't know. Even four o'clock. Now we can adjourn. I'm available. Team. If the court so pleases. Now, if you want to continue. Wrap up your argument no, about no. Uh, the I'm not senior police. To, I'm not closer to wrap. No, 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 no. I'm sure. I'm, oh, no, I'm not closer. I was very interested in that argument. Is yes, it? Yeah. Well, may I proceed until I pass? Because uh, I'll tell you why. Because you're talking about cartridges, as, as if we're all talking at different uh, connotations. Am I correct? Sir? About cartridges. That's correct, my lord. And about uh, CMJ. And FMG. And FMG. It's three different uh, projectiles. That's correct. Must be. Must be. And the other interesting aspect is when it is put to you that uh, it was a 0.38. And I'm not saying you are wrong. It's just in my mind. My mind is tumbling. After hearing that uh, a 0.38. I mean, a, a cylinder. Cylinder is rotating. Doesn't eject. It doesn't eject, my lord, yes. So, but there were bullets found at that house. You've heard me. Can we stand up tomorrow?